perpetual peace approximates but is not the same as the religious and Christian notion of eternal peace. Kant's text understood that there was a critical turning point historically when the religious notion of peace, Pax, was exchanged for a modern and mechanistic notion of peace that was generated by the machinery of law and by the machines of state as a condition of its own sovereignty. So in other words, the passage of the notion of concept of peace itself from the church to the state is also the passage of a notion of peace from a spiritual and religious realm or idea to a secular and historical realm, which is why Kant uses the term perpetual, emulating both the mechanistic and energistic production of a machine that continues to run on a certain kind of energy, which in this case is war and conflict, and at the same time the notion of a historical continuity rather than a religious continuity of time that an engine of history itself will be made by war and by the terms and the pauses between wars, as certainly has occurred in the 20th century. Is Kant a philosopher of peacefulness, of rest, or is he a philosopher of a much more active engagement? I think he's probably more on my side than he's on the side of what is, after all, a Christian idea of peace, which is finally this ultimate rest. The whole issue that he raises about peace, if we substitute the word sustainable for perpetual, and if we think about civil society rather than, than warfare, this is a text that makes a proposition almost that we have to engage. Texts, you know, they are monuments of the soul. You, you, one, one will not forget texts that have proved that uh, they would not not um, become uh, true in reality, for instance, uh, Marx's manifesto. But it's most important, the fact that he has written that poetically at the same time. He is very poetical. And the same thing with that. that is, all those texts become like small um, um, I would say biblical manifestos hmm, for um, a better uh, for humanity hmm? they, they are indelible for Kant uh, in the late 18th century to have the imagination of, uh, of, of, of nations coming together is, is, is a great you know, uh, uh, expression of imagination. But at the same time, it's also a matter, a matter of common sense. At the time, you know, uh, European countries had been at war for, for, for many years. His thinking at the time is quite incredible. Uh, and, and, and therefore perceived as naive, uh, idealistic, and uh, you know, the guy is going to be seen as, as a dreamer and so on. But at the same time, you know, he's trying to make the incredible in dimension of his text credible through trying to imagine, to imagine what would be the institutional mechanisms which would give credence and, and credibility uh, and reality to his dream. Is it naive to think that uh, uh, member states, that states would give up their national interest, their short-term interest to really come together? And here I think that the element that we have to think about is that you know, there is not necessarily you know, conflict uh, between uh, uh, the, the national interest, the short-term interest, and the international interest. I mean, you know, think about individuals in a given society. We, we end up uh, working together, cooperating, uh, interacting in a, in, a, in, a, in a relatively reasonable fashion because we, we know that in the end it serves us. So this idea that uh, the pursuit of the uh, uh, national interest uh, would be uh, at odds or at war with uh, uh, the interest of all, I think is a bit uh, uh, is a bit misplaced. And sometimes being naive or being perceived as being naive is the best way. In fact, is really the way to be lucid. Peace is one of these concepts where um, it's easiest to understand what it is by talking about what it isn't. Uh, that is the virtues of peace often look like just the virtues of the absence of the vices of war. 
Uh, and um, I think there are many concepts like this. Actually, I think in some ways freedom is best understood by trying to understand what's wrong with being unfree. What's, what, what's wrong with the life of a slave? If you understand that, you'll understand why freedom is important. Peace is not a sissy, cultural, optional, you know, fluffy notion for the ladies who lunge. It is not a luxury for the philanthropists and the people who have nothing better to think about. Politics is not the antagonistic confrontation of friends and enemies. We've got to get some serious thinking in here. We talk a lot about coexistence and sustainability and um, whatever tolerance in the Netherlands, of course. It seems that peace has gone strangely out of fashion. I don't know what that means, but we got so used to a world that is constantly at war. And maybe we got used to it and we don't think about it, but I am rather concerned by it. There is a lot of talk of anti-war resistance to war, so it's more in the negative. Actively thinking a concept and a reality of peace seems to have exited our horizons. The fact that what is left of the left, which is not much, has espoused Carl Schmitt on top of everything else, makes me despair. And, and here I would be very critical of the extent to which people who call themselves critical theorists, uh, Zizek, Badiou, uh, a bit of Ranciere, but a lot of the left actually choose as their emblematic philosopher the one intelligent Nazi that we had in the Third Reich, which is Karl Schmitt, who was no minor figure in the thinking of European Nazism. So what is it with the left that we keep, we, we take a thinker who puts war and the elimination of the enemy and, and the dyad, the opposition, friend, enemy, at the core of political thinking. And, and why is the left even bothering to read this Nazi? I just don't get it. And I don't want to sort of simplify here a discussion, but between the two, if we have to sort of choose an anthology of great thinkers, please go back to the Kantian treaty on perpetual peace and dump this megalomaniac, totally sick mind that could only conceptualize interpersonal relationships in terms of the destruction of the other. So have we lost the sense of pacifism as a frame of thought? Is aggression and violence intrinsically part of what we consider the theoretical enterprise? I think that our ontological insecurity comes from destroying what we have collectively made. The nature of man and war, I think that that's a different issue from the possibility for peace. Because, yes, I think it is in our nature, you know, maybe to hit and to, to be selfish, that, that we, were, we are weak as individuals and we form groups that can even be more brutal against others because we are, but also because we are dependent, we are foundationally dependent. You know, we are not a self, I mean, we're not. So we need the group, and the group makes something. Uh, your uh, speakers tell you that they've put, uh, marginalized the word peace, or, or given it up, and that they're using security. I understand that very well. If you're pragmatic and you want to work on uh, the limits of a catastrophe, you will work on security. Human beings, uh, of course, are not supposed to refer only to the limited concept of security. They, they will aspire to peace, not thinking that it will arrive as Messiah, but that it has to be a horizon. You have to, or you, you are allowed to, and it helps to dream. Writing this text is an action. It's an action. It's extremely, extremely active. Uh, that it should turn out magically into uh, uh, a machine, a political machine, is something else. And it's not made for that. It's made to remind people, um, to uh, kindle uh, new ideas uh, to, to reactivate uh, desire for values. But I think that the, the movement that dictates this uh, perpetual peace project um, is admirable. And the fact that it is an admirable object has uh, a kind of uh, supernatural power.